Hey everybody, Michael Davis here, and uh, what a special treat today. We are coming to you from Rochester, New York, in the famed Eastman School of Music. And I'm so happy today to uh, have the opportunity to sit down with the two trombone professors from the Eastman School, Mark Kellogg and Larry Zalkin. Uh, Mark has uh, assumed a wide range of musical roles in his, in his career, all the way from performer to teacher to administrator. As I mentioned, he's professor of trombone, euphonium, and ch brass chamber music here at Eastman. He's also chair of winds, brass, and percussion department. Uh, he co-directs the trombone choir with Larry. Uh, he recently completed a 28-year tenure as a member of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, and he uh, was principal trombone for many of those years, as well as uh, a soloist numerous times. He has performed with the San Francisco Symphony, the Oregon Symphony, the Florida Orchestra, Charleston Symphony, and Symphoria. Uh, he's a frequent soloist with the famed Eastman Wind Ensemble, and he's equally active as a, a jazz and chamber musician. Uh, he's a founding member of the group Rhythm and Brass. He's also performed uh, with many luminaries on the jazz uh, side of things, including Clark Terry, Wynton Marsalis, Eddie Daniels, Mel Torme. Uh, he has released two CDs as a solo artist. Um, he founded the Eastman School of Music's uh, Summer Trombone Institute. Uh, that was founded in 2006, and he was also the co-host of the International Trombone Festival, which was held right here at Eastman uh, in 2014. Uh, Larry Zalkin is the, uh, a proud native of California, Southern California. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's degree from the USC, uh, did some doctoral work at the University of Michigan. Uh, he was the principal trombone of the Utah Symphony, a position that he won in 1981 and he held that till uh, 2015 when he was working concurrently uh, as a teacher here as, as well as a principal trombone in, in Utah Symphony. Um, he has performed and recorded with numerous orchestras including the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Symphoria, the Chicago Symphony, uh, Atlanta Symphony, St. Louis Symphony, uh, Seattle Symphony, and RPO here in Rochester. Uh, also a soloist with a, a variety of orchestras, uh, wind ensembles and concert bands. He has released three, so, three albums as a solo artist, um, and in addition to his role here at Eastman, he's served as faculty on dozens of festivals and workshops. He is a Yamaha uh, trombone artist, and he was heavily involved in the design of uh, one of their large bore tenor trombones, so we'll get to talk uh, to him about that. So without further ado, Larry, Mark, man, thank you so much for making this all happen and spending time. I know you guys are busy like crazy, so um, the fact that you can sit down and... Uh, chat about your guys' incredible careers and also the legacy of the trombone here at Eastman. It's really a, a treat for all of us. Yeah, thanks. Our pleasure. Yeah. Well, let's jump in. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, tell us about your just some of your early uh, things you did as a, and what led you to music and specifically maybe what got you into the trombone. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I come from a, a, a relatively musical family. My dad was an amateur guitarist and, and uh and uh, pianist and actually he early on in his his younger days he gigged a little bit with the the jazz singer who's from Syracuse Mark Murphy oh wow sure sure yeah. yeah yeah so he that was kind of his 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 background oh, really cool. was, that was never his vocation but it was something he enjoyed doing and he was a you know um, he and my my mom were always very very supportive of me doing anything musical which I always appreciated lots of you know you know, it's like the hockey moms of today or something, you know, except, <laughs> yeah, right. except you know, they, they were music parents, you know, uh -huh. but they were always incredibly supportive. I had wonderful teachers um, and and early, early influences. And um, at the public school level, I had a wonderful uh, high school jazz program and, and a wind ensemble program that I got to participate in. And um, that really set the stage, and, and I felt like it really put me in a good place to be able to come to a place like Eastman. Mm, yeah. Nice. So, Larry, how about yourself? Tell us about Southern California. I'm a big California fan, being from Northern California. But, <laughs> but are you a Dodger fan? <laughs> oh, I'm definitely not a Dodger fan. <laughs> <laughs> I did not grow up in a musical family. Oh, okay. Um, my parents were not musical at all, and... Um, I was enamored with Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. I just, I loved that group and I wanted to play the trumpet. So I went to elementary school and this time they offered trumpet, uh, they offered uh, instrumental music in the third grade. 
Mm. Oh, I, I, you know, I started in third grade too. Did you yeah. really? I, it was, which is really a strange thing to start that early. You know, it yeah. is. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I remember I could not reach six or seven position. I was so yeah. small playing the horn. But uh, when I got to the front of the line, you know, I had been the disease. They, they, they lined them up alphabetically. <laughs> there, were, there were no more I trumpets. Never, I never uh, thought about that. Yeah, you're <laughs> going to at the end of the line. <laughs> So the, 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 the elementary music teacher, her name was Nora Graham, and she said, sorry, you, you look like a trombone player to me. And she gave me a trombone. <laughs> and literally, I could barely carry the case home. And the funny thing is, when, when I was playing the L.A. Phil, she came to a concert. I oh, my know. gosh. Wow. And um, the guard said, there's a, there's a woman outside to see you. And it was her. And I talked to her for like an hour. But anyway, that was such a strange experience. But... Um, so I, the music teacher kept saying, you know, you should give this kid private lessons. And my parents would say, God, we just can't afford it. But um, I started studying with a guy who agreed to take me on. He charged me $5 oh, for wow. a half hour. His name was Harold Diner. Okay. And Harold was a famous, I never knew it at the time, but when um, on This Is Your Life, when they did Tommy Dorsey's elementary school teacher, he had to play sentimental, that's live TV. You know, oh, wow. well, anyway, he tells that story all, he just died <laughs> recently. He was a hundred years old, but wow. uh, I stayed in touch with him and um, I got influenced to go to Cal Arts where they gave full scholarships to do the youth program at Cal <clears throat> through the arts. And it was an amazing, experience. we played in a full orchestra. I remember we were playing Symphony Fantastique and I didn't know how to read clubs. And I just sat down. So I'm just playing it in bass clef. And the conductor, Cesare Pasquale, he's like, he's going like this. Like, Trombone, look at your clefs. I looked at the guy next to me and we shrugged. I mean, we didn't know, you know anything about it. So we just kept playing in bass clef. But by the time I was in 12th grade and graduated that program, it was amazing. We had a background in theory. And also I had a great um, high school music mm. teacher. So by the time... Um, I got to USC. I had been directed to study with uh, Tommy Johnson, was the coach of our brass quintet at Cal Arts. The great tuba player. The great wow. tuba player, yeah. And he was such a mentor. He was such an amazing guy. And he directed me. Finally, I went to uh, study with Byron Peoples, oh, nice. who didn't charge me for lessons. He was just the nicest person. Byron was oh, so amazing. Great. And Byron said, You got to study with Marstow. And I said, Well, I, I can't. How could I do that? So he prepared me. And I studied with Marstow in my 12th grade. So um, wow. that's how Fantastic. I got. Fantastic. Yeah. That's and so I got that's, to USC. <laughs> that's awesome. You just, you brought back some nightmares to me because I was in the Santa Clara Youth Symphony and I uh, had the exact same experience with the uh, tenor class. I had no idea. And it was just a nightmare. But yeah. I, but it was good because it forced me to learn uh, the tenor and alto clef yeah, yeah. early on. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned USC. What was the experience like? And I want to talk to Mark about Eastman. And as as, as a student, well, that must have been a very, USC has always been a, a really strong program. How, how was the experience for you? I think the experience at Eastman was similar to the mm. experience at USC. It was, you know, next to Eastman, I think it was the greatest faculty in the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the brass faculty were Marsteller, Jimmy Stamp, Vince DeRosa, and Tommy Johnson. The string faculty was Heifetz, Piatigorsky, <laughs> Primrose, and the backup teachers were like Yuta Shapiro and Gabby Rito. Wow! And then um, you know, Obo was Bill Chris, and Bassoon was Hertzberg, and uh, clarinet was a famous Mitchell Lurie. You know, it was just like it was yeah. an wow. all-star class. Yeah. Great group. And um, I just couldn't believe it. I would go to the Piatigorsky master. I said, I played a cello piece once, and Marcel was shaking his head, and he just said, "What are you doing? You need to go to Piatigorsky's master class." So I went to his master class, and I would. I kept going. I just I would hear these great cellists play. It was just an, an unbelievable experience. Wow. What know? was it like? Uh, did you study with Jimmy Stamp at all? I did, but this is a story. Do you want to hear? It? I do. I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> by his method and a lot of you know yeah. through Malcolm McNabb. I learned about uh, more about him, but he seemed like a really amazing teacher. So I'm curious to when anybody had had the experience to study with him, what their feeling was. I was only 17 when I got to USC, and I was very immature, but I knew I wanted to study with Stamp. Hmm. And Stamp and Marsteller didn't get along, because oh, Marsteller okay. was not into buzzing at all. He was a Remington student, just hard and fast, and um, Stamp's whole method revolved around buzzing. And I, it's not that I wanted to take on this Amish or buzzing thing, but I wanted to learn Stamp's method, because his trumpet students were so good. Sure. So. 
I went to Stamp and I said, I'd like to study with you, but you can't tell Marcel. And he said, fine, and he never did. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's a testimony to how, what a nice person he was, what a good guy. I studied with him for two years and I really learned his method. And while I don't buzz like he did, I'm still not very big on buzzing. I'll use it once in a while if a player has a particular problem. Ironically, it's a good way to move air when you do low buzzing and right. you move your air. But um, what was amazing about him is that this this you know when you slur up stay low aim for the low side of the note when you slur up and he's the one that first taught me that and it really has defined my my teaching and my mm. playing to this point he he was really something i always value my time with him wow that's awesome that's so two years one. he never told marshall or marshall never knew and that was good <laughs> you know, awesome a couple a couple of my students who we do here we do swap lessons every semester where okay. i study or I, I work with larry's students and mine have the good fortune to work with him and a couple of my students this week were talking about you making that comment to them about as you're slurring up slur to the lower part of the partial and you know all that kind of stuff and so yeah that's great that's yeah. great yeah <laughs> mark i know we intersected a couple of years i think here at eastman and, yeah. and we were friends from way back then but but yeah. uh maybe share the experience you had uh as a student here uh, sure yeah well it was really it was really wonderful um, because it's it's always been Eastman's always been just a really good community of people. Mm -hmm. All the faculty uh, are resident faculty, so everybody's here. They're very invested, and it was like that then as well. And um, so for me, the 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 great thing was having a chance to have to play with, uh, you know great, great players and be inspired by great players. I mean when I got here as a freshman, you were, a, I think, a senior. Uh, Paul Welcomer was a senior. Right, Scotty right. Hartman was a, a grad student. Mark Luss was a grad student. Lisa Albrecht was in my class. I mean, and I'm, I, uh, Tom Hornick, wonderful um, uh, um, trombonist in the Bay Area. I mean, there are just all kinds of, of great folks who were here and very inspiring. Steve Witzer had just left, mm -hmm. but his he still cast a really you know big shadow. He sure you know? did. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, so anyway, just being around players of that caliber and having really important mentors around the school who never even knew that they were my mentors, you know, <laughs> but like people like, you know, Ray Ricker, uh, sure. John Hunsberger, um, and like you, you know, I studied with, uh, with John Marcellus and, you know, that, that was, a that was a, a you know, a, a really cool experience. And the, the thing I think I learned the best, the best lesson I, I feel like I, I got from him was just, uh, he let people be who they were mm -hmm. as players. Yeah, yeah. Know? And he wasn't trying to make everybody sound the same. He wasn't, you know, using the same methodology with every student. I mean, he, you know, people were really treated and, and quite frankly, kind of celebrated as individuals. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, um, and, you know, that has its upsides and, and maybe it even has a shadow side to it as well, like it does for any of our methodology. But um, he, you know, really let people, you know, be who they were so mm -hmm. and i had had a chance to you know play a lot of euphonium while i was here and played on several recordings with the wind ensemble with with don and um yeah i i can't say enough about the experience that i had here mm -hmm. great great uh brass quintet coach with barbara butler yeah i mean you know and you know just a real it was a really just a terrific experience being here as a student that's awesome yeah um Let's jump forward now a little bit and tell what Mark, why don't you keep going and just sure. talk about some of your early experiences as a professional, um, maybe some of the things that helped shape your career and the success you had. And I, you, you got in the Rochester Philharmonic pretty soon after graduation, right? Am yeah. I, or am I mistaken? On yeah, that? not too far, not too far after. And there was a, there was a middle step in there. So I, I, um, I went to school here, graduated, and then um, I took a, a, a year where I wasn't in school, but I, I taught at several universities adjunctly around the Rochester and Syracuse area. I subbed a lot with the orchestra in Syracuse, hmm. the then Syracuse Symphony. I, I subbed a fair amount here in Rochester, did all kinds of what were then pretty plentiful big band gigs, and mm -hmm. even there was a, you know, for a market our size, there was a fair amount of, of um of studio stuff that was happening in rochester mm -hmm. actually for you know for for uh, sports channels and all kinds of stuff so anyway that was a great year of just you know taking everything that i learned from my time at eastman and trying to just implement it and not 
and 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 not be a student. Mm -hmm. And it was during that year that I was really very fortunate to win a one year position playing in the San Francisco Symphony. So I went out there for a year, knowing that it was a very finite experience. You know, it was going to be great, but very finite. And I just uh, took an audition for uh, the orchestra here in Rochester. So came, uh, I ended up coming back here the next year when my year's position in San Francisco was, was up. Mm. And then a year and a half or so later, I started teaching here as well. Mm. Nice, nice. How about yourself, Larry? I mean, uh, I'm sure you're working in L.A. And while you were in college and whatnot, but maybe what was your, what was your you jumping was... off point there, yeah. pro professionally speaking? <laughs> I jumped. I'm not sure where I landed, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, so... You, the L.A. scene was really influential on the USC scene. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had to learn jazz. You had to learn to double. I took uh, jazz improv lessons with Charlie Shoemaker. Oh, Charlie was one of the a great improv teachers. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He was, oh, yeah. So he was a vibes player with the George Shearing group. And he all of a sudden his wife was pregnant. And they thought, well, we can't be on the road and have a kid. So he settled in a very pretty fancy neighborhood, actually and um, began teaching jazz. And he had this method and he taught anybody. You were a trombone player. He had all the J.J. Johnson solos transcribed. And he'd give you, you know, Sonny Stitt solos and Charlie Parker solos. It didn't matter what. You had to learn them at all keys. You had to improvise. It. I'm gonna date myself. It's real to real tape. He had um, recorded uh, backing and comps and um, recorded the original solo for you to listen to, try to get the inflection and everything. And um, mm. and that that studying um, was meant so much to me because you think when you get an orchestra job you're not going to have to do that right right it was like my uh -oh. third week in the orchestra and I might date myself again Lionel Hampton came to play oh okay so you know and um, I had talked to a couple people about playing jazz but I hadn't really done it and um, he turns around at the group and he says uh, you know. Does anybody blow? You know, and and everybody kind of pointed to me, and I was like, "Oh my God, I'm gonna die!" But anyway, so I sat awesome. there and played B flat blues with Lionel Hampton for like three nights, you know, and it was it was amazing. But we were we were taught, you know, you had to double on bass trombone. The one thing I didn't do was double on alto. Mm. So when I got to Utah, um, there was a a guy conducting a German conductor, and he wanted an alto trombone on the Rhenish. And so the personnel manager told me, and I said, um, I said, it's okay, I can do it on tenor. He said, no, he wants it on alto. I said, really, I, I, it really will sound fine on tenor. He said, you don't understand. He doesn't care if you can do it on tenor. He wants it on <laughs> alto. <laughs> you do play alto, don't you? And I said, oh, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I found a terrible alto trombone that I borrowed from somebody. And the, the principal trumpet at the time was, was Ed Court, who went on to teach it. IU, and we were playing it, and I was so out of, I mean, I'd never played it before, I was so out of tune. Man, that's, that's, I was trial just, by fire. It right. was, yeah. it was, you think you can do it, and then you sit down, and of course now I play alto all the time, but back oh, then, wow. but that's, that's 35 years ago, you know, and finally, I kept saying, I'm sorry, Ed, I'm sorry, and finally he looks and goes, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, oh, that's great. But I eventually learned how to play alto. But I learned to play valves a lot because you know that's what you did in LA. Yeah. And um, so by the time I got to Utah, I had a pretty good, solid education in, in a lot of things. But growing up in LA did that at the time. Yeah, I don't know if it's still that way. Yeah, I would but, think I would think it probably is. But that's yeah. a great story about the alto. I know when I when I was a student here, Steve Witzer, who was a real mentor to me, and we played in a trombone quartet together, and he loved playing alto. And he kept trying to get me to play out, and I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, hey, I'm not going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> I, looking back, I wish I had kind of invested some time in it. But uh, um, you guys, when I was doing the research for this, uh, looking at your guys' amazing careers, um, it was really impressive how many different orchestras you guys have played with. Mark, you just mentioned San Francisco, one of the great orchestras, and in addition to your full-time positions, but going out and, you know, L.A. Phil, Chicago Symphony, whatnot. Um, I was just thinking for fun, you could mention some of uh, maybe some of your favorite maestros that you've gotten to uh, to play under, and and uh, and maybe even if there's certain groups that you played with that, that really stood out to you in uh, in terms of your own musical enjoyment. Um, I 
I still think, to me, I mean, a lot of classical musicians who have played with a lot of conductors are going to laugh at this, but I still think Zubin Mehta is probably the best conductor mm. ever. And and the last time I played with him, he yelled at me a lot during a concert. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but wow, still, I still think he's amazing. It's yeah. just it's just me. I did that year in L.A. with Dudamel, and everybody, you know was asking me a lot about Dudamel. He was fantastic. Yeah. He was just incredible. But Maida, he just had this control of things. You know, I hate to say this, I thought Lauren Moiselle was really good. Mm. Yeah. Um, again, not a very nice person to work with. Ah. Uh, he didn't lay in, I, he, fortunately he didn't lay into me on the week I worked with him, but he did lay into the principal second violinist who was really, I mean, but he was a great, great conductor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Wow, interesting. How about yourself, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, the when I was in San Francisco, the music director was Herbert Blomstedt. Oh, he was ninety-seven or something like that, and still working all the time. Wow! And, yeah, wow! And he was a he was a very particular kind of musician. He wanted things to be like a certain way. Spont spontaneity was not necessarily something that he. Um, he underscored as being super important but solidity and he made everybody play together really, really mm. well and the recordings that that orchestra did I, I was lucky enough to be a part of, of some nielsen and hindmith and, and stuff like that were just are still hold up really really well mm. um and additionally um tilson thomas you know is is a is a such a you know, such a, 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 I've only played for him, you know, three or four weeks in my life, but, you know, that was a very, a very fun experience. And I, and I have to say here in Rochester, um, we, we, we had some very wonderful conductors here through the years. And the person that was our music director for 13 of the years that I was in the orchestra here, uh, is a, um, a British conductor, really wonderful musician and a really good person, a guy named Christopher Seaman. Mm. And he was our, our music director and, and he, he was, he was wonderful as a music director not only because he was a good musician but he was i feel a very good psychologist at how to work with different people within the orchestra and how to let that like know that you know what he the way that he would impart advice to one person didn't necessarily work with another person mm -hmm. and he was very good at sussing that out and really and he was i think a really good administrator mm -hmm. of the orchestra mm -hmm. uh, which is you know uh, an important thing for a music director yeah. so um Anyway, I've been really, really lucky, and just in terms of groups, I would just say that the the, the chamber group that, that I was lucky enough to be in on when it, when it started, Rhythm and Brass, was a really, that was a, a terrific uh, experience for me, too, because it was a chance to use a lot of different skill sets for me in jazz and classical things, commissioning pieces, transcribing music, and 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 just wonderful, wonderful colleagues to get to work with, yeah. And nice. we're all, you know, all over, I think we did a hundred and... 80 concerts or something the the first full year that we were full time so wow. we were busy yeah wow. yeah but it was all great stuff that was a great group is, yeah. is rhythm and brass still in existence you know i in, i think they occasionally still get together and play but certainly ah. not on a regular basis ah. everybody in the group um ended up i think prioritizing not wanting to be on the road and everybody got really nice college teaching positions and hmm. And um, and decided that that was where they were going to put their energies. And but I'm still in touch with people from that that group. Uh, our mutual dear friend Alex Schuren, for example, and Charlie Villarubia, fantastic tubist, who's the who's the um, uh, tuba um, uh, professor at UT Austin. Mm. Rex Richardson, trumpet soloist. Uh, who teaches in Virginia, uh, Whiff Rudd, who's the uh, right. yeah down at Baylor University. Right. Uh, all just class classy guys and wonderful players and they were great colleagues that's awesome yeah larry i have to share this uh, uh we had phil the great phil smith an amazing former uh, principal trumpet in the air philharmonic he was an early guest on our bone to pick series and gotten to work with phil a lot in new york and studio stuff and whatnot he said the same thing about zubin Mehta. he it loved really... he loved zubin Mehta, and he he had this for those who uh, are watching the interview you might want to go back and check that out uh, what phil talks about because he just said he said Zubin was so encouraging to him, and he said it, it made his job so easy to him. He, he he said he had this way of looking at Phil before a solo or something, and just like 
Phil, this is going to be awesome. You're going to sound his yeah. weight on this. Yeah. And said, Phil yeah, just yeah. felt like, wow, I can just, you know, play and be, be myself. And he, similar feeling, like he just felt like Zubin was one of his, his favorites as well. That's so wonderful. It's to nice to hear that from wow. you as well. So, yeah. um, well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about where we are in the Eastman School of Music, this amazing institution. And um, I'm sure most of our viewers know that um, this, the legacy of, of trombone players coming out of Eastman is, is astonishing, probably the, uh, the, the strongest program in any uh, school in terms of graduates and, and job placement and whatnot. Largely, I think, because of Emory Remington. He mm -hmm. was the, uh, I don't know if he was the first trombone teacher, he but was, yeah. he was, okay. Yeah. And he what, taught here for almost 50 years, I think, right? Yeah, from and, the time the doors opened until he passed in 70, 1971, so either 49 or 50 years, something like that, yeah. And, and the range of, of uh, incredible players, I mean, it's, you know. Marstell, you talk about the Ralph Zauer, and then you've got commercial players like Bill Reichenbach and Jim Pugh, and just great all of the whole range of, of yes. students that he. Yeah. Uh, then that was followed up by Donald Knob, and of course John Marcellus, and uh, and now you guys, and uh, you're carrying on this amazing legacy and doing uh, doing it quite well, I might add. Mm -hmm. I was just, it's kind of a big, wide question, or, to, and that's really a question, the topic, but. What is uh, your feeling about the, the, the history, the legacy, and, uh, and, and how you guys are looking at the future of the, of the, of the studio here? Yeah. I know there's, a, there's like four or five questions in there, but uh, <laughs> go. <laughs> Mark, let's start with you. Sure, yeah, that, that's, it's a great question um, and, and a great topic to kind of like, you know, just kind of uh, banter on, but um, I think that the anybody who I, I always say this and I always say it because I mean it anybody who plays or uh, trombone or teaches trombone at the Eastman School kind of stands on Remington's shoulders mm -hmm. you know, really um, and, I, and and I think that's always a good thing to, to remember there's just a, like you said there's a legacy of lots and lots of great playing and lots of great teaching that's that's happened here all with very different approaches but all I think with a very musical, you know, touchstone that really has has, has guided things, and uh, with different strengths through the through the years certainly. But um, I, you know, I, I think that the 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 best thing currently for, for from my standpoint is that you know this is my thirty first or thirty second whatever year of teaching mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and uh, so I and I went to school here as as you were kindly you know talked about. And and so I have a certain degree, for whatever it's worth, of institutional memory about about what Eastman has been about. You mm -hmm. know? And when when Larry joined, I felt like, and still, he has kind of this view of uh, uh, looking at things with a new set of eyes that I really value a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so I think that in that way, I mean, not to break my arm patting us on the back, but I but I feel like we're a good combination mm. because of, of, of that. Absolutely, yeah. And so, um, and, and it's important to have both those things. You know, if you get too mired in tradition, tradition's great, but if you get too mired in it, that's not good. And if you're trying to reinvent the wheel all the time, that's that has its downsides too. You know, so I, I really I really appreciate the combination of, of where we are right now. And I think it's it's great for, for the students. I mean, Larry and I are good friends, or dear friends. Uh, we have a lot of respect for one another and it's it's a really I think it's really important for the students to sense that. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. and it's not like it's a hard thing to do. I mean it's very genuine, you know. And so uh, you know we trade students, we uh, you know we both do trombone choir together and it's it's great for the students to see that level of cooperation because I think it sets a, a tone for the way they feel as they progress professionally you know so those are just some kind of off yeah. the top things oh know. awesome yeah. yeah yeah and so you're the new guy what do you think Larry <laughs> <laughs> well Mark understates his memory a little bit it is phenomenal <laughs> yeah. and his knowledge of, of I learn things about this school every day because um, it's just so it's so extensive. It, it's so deep. The just the the history. I was in the Eastman Theater classrooms a couple of years ago. I'd already been here three or four years, and 
I got lost. I couldn't get out. I had to call the students. I'm lost. I'm like, yeah. I mean, the school is just so vast. There's just so much to it. But the one thing I'll say is it's continued its trajectory in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So in Remington's time, I mean, he was amazing. We hear one student after another. Like, his students come back, they'll knock on my door. I don't know who they are. I studied with Remington back in whatever, and what incredible memories I have. And, and it's yeah, just, there's it's a, just yeah. amazing. Oh, and then the, yeah. they get together. Don Hunsberger was telling me they get together on Zoom and some of the Eastman uh, the Remington alumni talk about yep. and there are so many people that want to know about this so they go on zoom but um it was a different time back then mm -hmm. I mean I remember when I was looking at colleges Eastman was like out there this was the epitome of going to mm -hmm. college I went to USC but um Eastman was out there today uh, you've got Juilliard you've got Curtis you've got Northwestern and Rice and uh, all yeah. these yeah. schools just everywhere yeah. yeah it's incredible yeah and we have to compete with that and um it's not just this is where all the good trombone players go so we work to create an environment that's really positive for mm -hmm. the students mm -hmm. and what i like about eastman like mark said we're here all the time and um a student can come here and feel like they can meet their own needs so they come here whatever they want to make i mean just my students have just the t short time i've been here they've become successful in careers that are so diverse mm -hmm. and i think that's where we're going today you yeah 100 percent. Um, yeah no question yeah yeah so, so that's I, awesome. i'm yeah. really proud of what we do here mm -hmm. you know yeah. and it's a great collaboration and we just you know yeah we well, we work hard <laughs> yeah well as a as a trombone alum kudos to you guys for, <laughs> oh, for well. keeping the uh not only keeping the tradition going but but growing it and and like you're saying i think you're absolutely correct there it's it's uh that that whatever you want to call it versatility creativity however you're approaching a career as a trombonist it's much different than it was in the, in the remington era and it's still it's, i think we would all agree it's still very possible but it's you have to you have to and you have to be open to the possibility of change and all these these different yeah. aspects of it and whatnot. Right. yeah and you know something that just kind of um, um build on what Larry was saying to me one of the strengths of any program is is not necessarily there are lots of rubrics and lots of ways you can think about it but but is not necessarily okay who got a job in a major orchestra from your class mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what are the people who didn't get a job in a major orchestra what are they doing right and are they still in music right and are they still involved are they still fulfilled mm -hmm. and happy in music mm -hmm. and and I think largely our our students here are you know Paul Racky in the LA Phil is a student of Larry's I've had some success with students in military bands and in in, in in major orchestras here and in, down in Charleston South Carolina it's etc et so you know we that happens here but also almost I think more importantly it's you know what happens you know to people who ne necessarily don't win a job in a full-time you know mm -hmm. orchestra people are going to have to cobble together a, a living you know these days with three or four different things that they do I mean they're going to have to be versatile they're going to have to be well spoken they're going to have to be able to speak and write well mm -hmm. they're going to have mm -hmm. to be able to you know get along with people which is you know the most important thing you know for anybody in any job but anyway and that's to me that's something i'm i'm actually really proud of yeah you know? awesome so, yeah. yeah well well said I, I couldn't i couldn't agree more one of the things i always find fascinating and and i, I admire you mark and i'm sure larry it, it does it very well as well i just don't know larry as well as, as, well yeah. as i know you sure is navigating the various paths that you have to do in the academic world and and i think that's largely why i've never gone into that because actually, <laughs> because frankly no bridge is too small for me to burn <laughs> not quite i've tried to get a little Hardly. better in my in my uh, older years <laughs> no, here but no. uh, but you know what i mean how, how sure. what, yeah. what is it like uh yeah. you know just kind of navigating and being successful i mean i see walking around with both of you guys being here for the residency I see everybody likes you, you know, and well, you stick your head in and the theory teacher, they're like, hey, Mark, you know, hey, yeah. Larry, they, it's, yeah. it's good. It's a very positive thing going on, but how, how do you approach it? Yeah, it's, well, that's a great question. The, I think it's, it's very easy at any, at any um, music institution for there to be 
an, um, um, you know, a dog and cat kind of relationship sometimes between <laughs> academic faculty and performance faculty. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. They both kind of are, are two fast moving trains that sometimes go in different directions. But here, I really feel like there's a, a nice cohesion between the two faculties and two different types of faculties. And, um, and I, and it's, and it's like that, you know, with the, the jazz area and the classical area or the music education area and the performance faculty. I mean, there's a, sure, there's always going to be a sense of some bit of a silo, you know, that's uh -huh. going to happen. But by and large, there's a, a really good community. And, and so that makes navigating within a, a university or a, a college, you know, a lot easier yeah for sure yeah. but it, it's it's mostly you know just being a good communicator and this the kind of the exact kind of things that you have spoken about in your residency here like answering emails on time being, <laughs> yeah. being proactive with like you know really communicating with people uh you know trying to take care of the uh, of the small stuff really taking care of the details and just you know just just taking care of business and also you know quite frankly you know i, I feel like you know, the administration, you know, I feel like the faculty are here to serve the students, you know, and I feel like the administration at any school is here to, you know, quite frankly, to kind of serve the faculty and help uh -huh. them uh -huh. serve the students better. Uh -huh. So I think as long as everybody's aware of that pyramid, um, it makes for a, it makes for a, a much smoother ride for everybody. Mm. You know, that's mm -hmm. not to say that the administration is not important or that, you know, faculty is supreme or whatever, but it's just, I think it's a really natural flow. Yeah. 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 I'm sure everything, all those parts have to be working together for, exactly. there, for there to be yeah. uh, good success with it. Yeah. Uh, how about yourself, Larry? I mean, I know you've been teaching for a long time, but being out of the orchestra now and being, having been here for a number of years now, it was a big adjustment mm. to go from playing in an orchestra. I mean, when when you have a concert, you whatever happens, it happens. You sit down, you know, on the deck, you have a glass of wine, you go to bed. I mean, that's it. You do a day of teaching, you come home. There's a thousand things in your head that you've mm -hmm. got to still yeah. do, and you know, it's hard to just. It's a hard adjustment. And the other thing is that, um, you know, coming here uh, to a whole new it's people you've never known never you know and the one thing i can say is that eastman everybody really gets along and there's there's no animosity that i could find there's no real you just kind of go into the flow huh. and it just uh it just worked well huh. so it's just great it's just nice to to come into this environment yeah and, yeah well, I tried to bring as much animosity from New York as I could, but I, I'm only here for a few days, so that can only do so much. <laughs> There's a lot of love. <laughs> um, well, this this is something that I think would be interesting to to uh, some of our viewers, and um, you know, tonight we're having the uh, the big celebration, the 80th anniversary of the Trombone Choir and the big concert in the Eastman Theater, which is rare for the trombone. I don't think I ever played in the Eastman Theater with the Trombone Choir when I was right. a student here. Yeah, so right. that's awesome. Um, what's also been awesome is getting to play with your guys' students, really from top to bottom, just a, a really fine group of, of trombonists at the school now. Um, and I'm curious what... It, it, you can get as specific as you want. What do you look for in people that want to come to Eastman and come audition for you? What is, what are the qualities that uh, you guys are looking for in, yeah. the, in these young players? Yeah. Well, just uh, to me, I mean, yes, you want people who play with a great sound, and you want people who like have you know um, demonstrate a sense of you know technical acuity and you know, like all those things, right? And a knowledge of repertoire and all that stuff. But for me. I really am interested, really interested in what someone's creative creativity mm. is like and mm -hmm. their curiosity. Mm. Curiosity to me is really, really important. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Now, it, do, you know, if you're really curious but you play with a bad sound, does that, you know, <laughs> you know of course it's not going to, that's not going to, going to help a lot. But someone who's curious, who's always kind of striving, who's looking for new things that that may challenge them in a, in a new and unique way, um, and and they, they 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 take a bite out of that challenge. Boy, that's to me that's that's really great mm. you know, to be around around students that that really that really buy into that mm. and, and live that. So I, people who are curious is that that's that's to me that's really 
that it's really important. In fact, I have a, and I won't pull it out, but I have a thing I carry with me every day. It's a little, it's a, something my son gave me. It's a little Curious George medallion, and I carry <laughs> it with me all. all it's a, from a, yeah, an old keychain. Okay. It's like, and it's just a, a, a you know thing. It's in my little rabbits, but you know to like, yeah, that's right. It's important to be curious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. I mean, yeah, it's kind of over overstated maybe, but. Yeah, that's 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 great, and 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 you know, at having a you know looking for for students who like really want to be a part of a community, and they mm -hmm. want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. You know, quite frankly, that to me is 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 really important, and, and contribute you know in ways you know that that are really special to them. But know that they're a part of, uh, it, and this is a good thing that they've attached themselves to something that's that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, attitudinally, those are things that to me are really important. Yeah, how about yourself, Larry? What do you? Well, when we audition at Eastman, we have an interesting process because we, we do an audition. There's a pre-screen and audition, and we do a master class after the auditions for where we get to know the student, see how they work with us, see how yeah. they react. And then we do a concert, mm. and it's always interesting to see how these kids react to hearing our students, you know. Um, and um, so a student comes in, takes a lesson, and then he does an audition how much did he learn from that lesson what is he incorporating into his playing the kid takes a lesson you tell him you know he's got to do all these things and then he comes in and he's done nothing even though he's a good player it's kind of telling you that maybe it's not the right fit mm -hmm. you know or um or you know you can talk to the student and, and learn so much um for me i I really go for nice people. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I want a really good you're here. Yeah. person, yeah. you know, yeah. to come into my studio. And we've been lucky; we've done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's know? great. Yeah, I, I, so. I, I second that because <laughs> just in talking to the students, it was, you know, a pleasure. You know, yeah. really nice people and really fine young players. Terrific. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've always uh, appreciated uh, about Eastman is the fact that you can run the gamut of, of musical styles in, in your studies. Um, and I always say that in my own master classes and whatnot, that what I got out of Eastman, in addition to being around players like Mark and Steve Witzer and uh, Chris Brayman, and the, the list is a, quite a long one. Yeah. Um, but it was the ensemble experience of one in the, in the afternoon I'm playing in Philharmonia and that night we have a jazz ensemble rehearsal and my brass quintet has a gig this weekend and then I'm, my small group, my jazz small group is doing some. It was, it set the table so well for me as a, as a professional freelance person in New York because you, yeah. you, know, you just don't know what, what it's, what it's going to be and that's part of what I love about it myself. And I think Eastman is one of the strongest programs of all of these music schools in that regard. And you guys have done a great job uh, with the trombone studio. So it's an, almost an extension of your, you know, your playing too. You know, we focused a lot on the, the teaching, but you guys are both still very active as players. You've uh, re released solo projects and your solo projects run that same stylistic range. Mm. So I just wanted you to touch on, you know, how you approach balancing um, jazz and, and for lack of a better word, classical playing. And I know, Mark, you, you actually are the jazz trombone teacher here, right. in addition to yeah. being a professor of trombone. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. how do you, how do you uh, kind of balance that? Yeah, and, and then I teach euphonium here as well, right. you know, which is something that Larry would be fully capable of, you know, of, of doing, certainly, because he's such a great euphonium player. But, but um, yeah, it's, I have, my studio load here is almost always a very even split of a third and a third and a third. And wow, so okay. I have a weekly studio class. And so um, in my studio class, the jazz players get to hear great euphonium players. The euphonium players get to hear great classical trombone majors. The, you know, the classical majors get to hear great jazz. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a really good exposure. And I've had a number of students who uh, have said to me, you know, maybe they were like jazz majors, and they're like, 
You know those bichet tubes you make me maybe used to make me work on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm really glad you did. You know, <laughs> yeah. For example. Yeah. You yeah. Know, sure. Or, or um, you know, a, a, a trombone major who has found themselves teaching on a faculty and is a is in a search for a euphonium uh, faculty member and is like, man, I'm really glad I got to like check out some good euphonium playing when I was a student. I know like festive overture, Schoenberg theme and variations, the whole. So I know those pieces. You know. So it's just, it's a. I think that the 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 difficulty can be when uh, we try and make um, we try and separate music into categories too much, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you know really trying to knock that down and say, okay, everybody in this room right now has to play with a good sound. They have to be in tune. Uh, they have to listen really carefully to what else is going on around them and copy what they're hearing. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, There's a lot of commonalities here, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Now let's talk about you know F sharp is two and three. You know, it's just like it, it just there's so there's so much more that is the same and is different that it's you know it it's sometimes it's almost kind of laughable to me that people try and like silo things so much because it's just there it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. How about you? I know that, that was a great story about Lionel Hampton when you're <laughs> joining the orchestra. So yeah. obviously, you are comfortable, uh, you know, straddling that uh, that line. You know, it's it's interesting at Eastman. Um, we have maybe four or five jazz trombone players at a time. that are jazz majors. Yeah, yes, yeah, six. Say. Yeah, or maybe some is more than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. means there's four bands that have to be full. Yeah. So. Um, the classical students, I really encourage, we both encourage them to mm -hmm. audition for jazz band, and um, they get a lot of jazz experience here. I'll tell you, you know, when I was playing with the LA Phil, we premiered a piece called City Noir by John Adams. Oh, yeah. And there's a trumpet solo in there. That it's Hugh on Racy, right out of Chinatown. Oh, you know wow. I mean? yeah, okay. And I mean, the stuff you have to do when you're, a, a, I mean, the styles in a normal pop series are just yeah. incredible where you have to really understand these styles so i'm so glad that i had the experience and we try and i think mark and i both encourage our students to get this this commercial experience we play a lot of your music yeah, and uh, a lot of it which gives yeah. them a lot of challenging um they they love your music we just oh, just you. last week uh, um um what was it called? Purple Mountains? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we did that. And oh. I, I conducted badly, but I conducted. <laughs> and, but I think what Mark kind of understates the success he's had in the jazz area, but you've had like, like so many players win the jazz competition at ITF. It seems like it's a, like a yearly thing. I and mean, we have great jazz players that come yeah, out here. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really it's yeah. really good. I'm, yeah. I'm really glad of that. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear to hear all that and also see it firsthand, you know, that it's continuing on in the same way that it was, even though when we were students, they, were, they didn't have the undergraduate jazz major, but you were still very encouraged to take as Absolutely. much jazz classes and ensembles as, as you possibly could. Yeah. Um, I usually get somebody sends me an email after this if I don't ask about your equipment. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a big equipment guy, although I'm super happy to be on my Shire's uh, signature trombone and, and grateful for that. But but I know, uh, Larry, you were very involved in the development of a, of a horn for Yamaha. Maybe tell us a little bit about uh, that process and, and what, what equipment you're on these days. Well, Bob Malone came to me when I was in Utah. This was probably... 2007 okay. and said that he wanted to develop a new large board tenor for Yamaha and I was playing Shires at the time I really wasn't interested but they'd give me a horn to try it and I'd email back all the suggestions I had and they were doing everything that I was asking you know so it was getting pretty interesting uh -huh. so finally they came to my house and the designer uh, Nick Todd I think is his name and then um um the just a, a few yamaha people came and um uh, wayne tanabe and bob Malone, oh, yeah. and um they all came to my house and we just spent an afternoon just playing horns and trying things they brought soldering equipment and uh like a little like these little tools i don't even know what they were changing wow. things right on the fly <laughs> there oh you want this valve vented this way let me do this and they go over to my kitchen table and then come back and anyway so wow. I was really getting excited with this horn. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So then I'd go out. First it was 
in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then it went right. moved to L.A. And that was much more convenient for me being in Salt Lake City. So I go back and forth, and it culminated like we had the horn, and I was playing it, and I loved the horn. And I was doing the Rouse Concerto with the symphony, the Chris Rouse mm -hmm. Concerto, and it was the ITF. So it was the final concert of talk about stress. It was the final ITF concert. And um, that was the Rouse Concerto. Hmm. So, um, so they came to the concert. Wayne Tanabe, Nick Todd, and Bob Malone, all these Yamaha people, and um, they heard it. And then the next day, Sundays, if I wasn't tired after playing three performances, they we spent the whole day kind of finalizing it, and um, wow. we just spent the day at my house. And then it, they sent me a pre-production model, which I loved. It's the one I still play. Oh wow! And then they they put it into production. It was a little more nerve wracking than I thought because if this horn goes into production and then they find something that's not good, they've just produced a thousand horns or something. <laughs> you know what do you do? But then I thought, you know. If I like the horn, that's what matters. But yeah. a lot of a lot of people are playing that horn now, and it's um it's a it's a very good horn. It, it's kind of custom for me. My son is a trombonist, right. and he plays it, but he's he's uh, often critical of it. He's got it so heavy sometimes. You know, I said, yeah, I know it is, but you know, you get what you pay for, kind of. So, <laughs> you know, the heaviness you can it works for you if you if you enjoy it. So um, then we went to work on an alto. And I wasn't the only person, but I was one of the people that was kind of involved in that. And that's the Yamaha Custom that's out today. Mm. So um, I've loved it, and that's what I play. I play Carl Hammond mouthpieces. Mm. Okay. I play an 11 ml. I play a 14 S on my alto. I have a different mouthpiece for everything. I will say one thing, though. What I learned in the process, I used to go to Bob Reeves and have my mouthpieces cut. And I had the same rim for everything. Here's a cup for my bass trumpet here's a cup for my alto trombone here's a cup for my baritone i put that same rim on but you know when i started working on the alto trombone for yamaha i realized that when you have the big rim and it looks like a funnel you know going down like this it's not it doesn't work it doesn't yeah. center the air properly and the overtone series is off mm. and the intonation's off it doesn't sound yeah. the same throughout the range and i've just decided I got to just change mouthpieces and I found I can do it easily. Mm -hmm. I go to a 14S on the alto. I go to a, a 12 something for my baritone. It's just everything. I go, I play a 21 B, a 20 BL on my bass trombone and I don't try and keep the rims close anymore. Mm -hmm. I just make mm -hmm. the change. Like in your brain, you just switch gears and it's easy. It's just really easy to do. So I, I do that. That's but, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's good to hear. It's good. Mark, what are you playing these days? Any, you still on your con? Is I am, a, yeah. I've been a con summer person for a long time. Okay. Yeah, and enjoyed my association with them. They've been, you know, they've been very kind to me through the through the years. Um, I was a brief, briefly, I was a Yamaha artist because Rhythm and Brass was a Yamaha sponsored group. Mm, okay. But largely, um, and that was fine. That was great. But most of my career, I've been associated with with uh, with Con Selmer. I play on an old Con 88H, mm -hmm. you know, that actually has a, a bit of a story to it that it um, it used to belong to the um, former principal trombonist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Henry Charles Smith. Oh, and wow. so I, I, I was, it was actually, the instrument was given to me by someone who had been a student of Henry's and who had bought that horn from him. Huh. Wow. And he, this uh, person passed away and his family actually gave me the instrument and it's, it's a wonderful old, but I have four or five, you know, old con straight eights or 88 H's. And, um, and then I play for jazz playing, I play on a, a con 78 H. So huh. it's uh -huh. a 522 bore instrument. So it's, it's not super small, but it's also a, a, a little smaller and a little bit lighter than, you know, trying to play on a 547 bore instrument. Uh -huh. So, yeah. um, but those are the two main instruments that I play on. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, listen, this has been just been a fantastic uh, interview with you guys. I really appreciate the time and, and, uh, and the opportunity to be here at Eastman. And we thank Eastman for allowing us here and having our yeah. wonderful videographer, Michael, to help us out today. Yeah. Um, as we close out, I was going to just, and I often end this way because I think it's, it's great to get insight from people who've had the levels of success that you guys have had. What do you, what do you, if you, if you could give advice to younger players, and I know you do all the time because you're teaching at one of the best music schools in the country, but 
if you could if you could just offer a couple grains of uh of your, the wisdom that you've uh, got over the years and, and give that to the younger folks out there what uh, what, what would that be and we'll start with you larry well i, I used to quote janish starker and uh say that you know if you can think of doing anything other than music <laughs> you should do it but i I've, I've kind of tamed that down a little bit because um students they they have um they'll a lot of them will say well i can't think of anything else but I, you have to approach it with a healthy attitude a healthy mind you have to be well-rounded you have to be well-rounded as a person and see trombone as a part of that mm. and um and I think that's the best way to proceed. Wow, good advice. Mark, how about you? Well, you know, I, I always go back to something that my, my dad told me, who was a successful business person for a long time. And he always used to, used to tell me that nobody else is in charge of your level of enthusiasm for what you do except mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're, you know, not having a good time in the orchestra, it's so easy to say, oh, damn conductor, or man, this person or that person in the orchestra, or, you know, or if you're, you know, in a, in a Broadway show pit or, you know, whatever, you know, or playing in a small group or whatever, I oh, mean, the bass player's always rushing, you know, whatever, <laughs> man, this is a drag, you know, okay, maybe, whatever, but ultimately it's up to each individual to find a way to be enthusiastic about what they do mm -hmm. and there's yeah. a great old quote um that i'm really fond of from a, a english theologian named charles charles wesley who said if um uh if you can if, if if you can light a fire of enthusiasm with what you do people will come from miles to watch you burn <laughs> you know in, in the best way that's possible, great in the yeah, best way yeah. possible you know not burn like you know, crash <laughs> yeah. and burn, but like you know they'll be drawn to that and I, I think so having a sense of enthusiasm about about what you do and finding that and and if you and if it's difficult for you to do that that kind of tells you something sure too, yeah you know? yeah yeah so um anyway I, i'd say i'd say that's the one thing i would i would pass pass along well yeah. really well said larry mark thank you again for uh being here today and for uh, hosting this and uh yeah. just just great to yeah. sit down and talk about this you know, great institution and what you get the work that you guys are doing here well our pleasure and thank I, you yeah thank you and i might say that we're really honored to have you here. Oh, thank you. And, and well, I mean that very sincerely. We and as we've talked about today, there are lots of great folks who've passed through, you know, Eastman uh, trombone or other instruments too. But you know, trombone, uh, and we've we've you know been lucky enough to to have you know some of them come back, and you know we're we're really happy to have you on our Mount Rushmore <laughs> of alums. You know, so we appreciate you taking the time to be here. With oh us. man, it's totally my pleasure. And yeah, and thank you for the, the kind words. So, yeah. I hope everybody enjoyed this as, as much as I did today. And uh, um, we will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick.